Good morning, CLF. You can go ahead and stand as we begin in our time of worship this morning. God, we invite your spirit into this place right now, Lord. We ask that you rest on us right now, God. Help us to focus on you right now as we start in our worship, Lord, as we lift up our voices, we lift up our hands to you, God. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. Yeah, I know you feel me. Yeah. As the spirit, as the spirit was moving over the water, spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Rest on us as the spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down, spirit. When you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you feel me. Yeah, I know you feel me. Oh, see fire and wind. And fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on. I'm here and I know you will 
And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good
so worthy of this moment right now, God, where we just get to gather together and lift you up and sing praises to you, God. This imperfect people, God, we get to come together and serve a perfect and holy God. And so we lift you up and we just say thank you, God, and we glorify your name, God. We say hallelujah. We give you our highest praise, God. Receive our worship this morning. Receive our praise, God. There is none other that is worthy of our time, our talent, our treasure, the way you are, God. Help us, God. Remind us, Lord, to put you on top, to put you in the middle, in the center of everything that we do, God. And so, God, I'm so thankful that we get to start a brand new week in worship. Good morning, church. All right, it snowed this morning. I didn't know that it snowed this morning. That's not okay. Um, like to dismiss fourth through sixth graders to Aaron back there. Fourth through sixth graders, you are dismissed. Be good listeners. Be nice. And don't pick your nose. <laughs> Happens a lot in that fourth through sixth grade class. You'd be surprised. Uh, if you, if it's your first, second, third, fourth time here and you haven't filled out a connect card, we would love for you to fill one out. We'd love to get to know you. We have a little gift that we'd like to give you and we just want to connect with you. And also you can use the connect cards if you are interested in being baptized, if you want to dedicate your child, anything you want to know. Trivia, go to the Connect card, the Connect Center, and um, it's that little room back there, and um, you can fill out a Connect card and turn it in there. And offering, there are three ways to give here at CLF. You can give online, you can give throughout the week, or um, you can give in person. There's a little black box in the back there, and you can give that way. So I'd like to invite the ushers forward, and we'll pray over the offering. God, we just thank you for your provision. We thank you, Lord, that you are Jehovah Jireh. You are God, the provider, Lord. And so we just thank you for your provision, Lord. And I just pray that you bless this offering, Lord. I pray that you let your will be done with it, Lord, and let every dollar go exactly where it needs to go, God. And we just thank you for your provision of this church. We thank you for your provision of these people, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, for all that you do, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As those offering buckets pass, Easter, it's coming up. Easter is very close. Yeah, clap it up for Easter. Best day ever. So Easter weekend, Good Friday service at 6.30 p.m. And then Easter Sunday, that'll be at 8.30 and 10.30. Everybody say 8.30 and 10.30. So the Good Friday service will be about 45 minutes long. It'll just be simple worship and a message, and then the, sun, the Easter Sunday services will be about an hour long each, and we will have kids ministry available. Come on, clap it up for our kids ministry volunteers, stepping up and serving, and uh, you can find Easter invites at the Connect Center. Awesome. This Tuesday is a prayer night at 6 p.m., so we hope that you show up for that, and then Marriage Matters. Everybody say, Marriage Matters. Yes. On April 6th at 6 p.m., Nate and Aaron Dorn will be sharing their testimony. If you missed it at the baptism night, you'll get to hear it again. It's an incredible testimony. And uh, bring a potluck dish to pass. It says no salads, just steak and meat. So just kidding. You can bring a salad. We'll just look at you funny. All right? And then also... Uh, dips and desserts with Pastor Natalie Millard for all ladies sixth grade and older. Come get to know our new kids pastor, hear her heart for ministry. You can bring a dip or a dessert to pass. Dipping chips and drinks will be provided with gluten-free and dairy options available. All right, at this time, I'd like to invite Miss Gail up for a few more announcements. Hi, everybody. 
I want to thank you for your participation in Operation Christmas Child last year. Uh, we were able to pack nearly a thousand shoebox gifts in conjunction with St. John's Lutheran Church. And so thank you, my you know heartfelt thanks to everybody that helped out. And for those of you who are new to our church, what's Operation Christmas Child? Well, it's a ministry that packs gifts in shoeboxes to give to needy children throughout the world. And then each child receives the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One person every 15 seconds accepts the Lord as a result of this ministry. And that's 24-7, 365 days a year. So it's pretty profound. And you're wondering, why is she talking about Operation Christmas Child now? Good question. Well, we're going to do something a little bit different this year for our collections because there's a lot of things going on in the fall, including a lot of financial obligations. We decided to collect hygiene items in April, clothing in May, and toys in June. Uh, the school supplies will collect in the fall because we can get the sale prices. So this will spread out you know, our expenditures. You can bring the hygiene items in April, starting April 6th. Any time throughout the month, there'll be a red barrel somewhere, maybe in the back or up here, in that, up here under the cross. Perfect. And um, for hygiene items, we're looking for toothbrushes, washcloths, and bar soap. No liquid soap or toothpaste. And we'll still have the packing party in fall. Um, also, for this is for seniors. On April 11th at noon on a Thursday, we're having a senior potluck, and that'll be in the worship area here. If your last name begins A through M, bring a main dish. A M through Z, bring a dessert. And if anybody would like to share a testimony, I'm looking for a couple people to share maybe a five-minute testimony. It can be from any time during your life. Uh, also, Saturday, May 4th, this is for anybody, any gal, 13 or over, we're going to have a jewelry-making workshop for Operation Christmas Child like we did last year, and it was a lot of fun for those of you that attended. Did you enjoy it? Good. Um, on Tuesday, June 11th, this is for the seniors, we are going to Capri Senior Symposium in Brookfield. Uh, this is an event I attended last year, and it was awesome. John McGivern is the main speaker, if you're familiar with him. There's going to be a free continental breakfast, breakout sessions, dancing grannies, and exhibits. <laughs> Carpooling is planned. Um, and I think eventually here we'll have a sign-up at the senior potluck because we'll have to know how many folks are going. And then way in the future, September 19th, it's a Thursday, we're having a card-making uh, 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 card workshop for Operation Christmas Child as well. So we just wanted to let you know some dates for those items. Thank you. How are you guys doing today? Great. Great. Pastor Ben, that's yours. Well, not yours, but it's yours. He's going to walk off with it. He said it's mine. I said it in front of everybody. Uh, one last thing I need to announce before we dive into the scriptures today is uh, last week we had a, a, a membership class, and unlike any other time ever before in, I think, our history, uh, every, well, not everybody, but a lot of people turned in membership forms, and we had a business meeting. And so I've got 12 new members to introduce to you today. So if you hear your name, just please just stand up, wave, sing a song. Uh, no dancing grannies, please. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Nate Aaron Dorn, Wayne uh, Hartwick Sr., and Lori Hartwick. Again, please just raise your hand, sit down. Nicole Hekimovich, Tim Hoffman, uh, James and Janet Shulka, Brian Stewart, Jeremiah Stewart, and Jeremy and Christy Stommel. Why don't you give that a uh, round of applause for our new members? And thank you guys. You may be seated. Well, hey, uh, this week we're continuing uh, with Acts chapter 19, kind of this, this short, very brief mini-series that I had launched into last week, and just kind of Acts 19, and just kind of felt the stirring of the Lord to, to go this direction. And um, I don't know about you, but there's sometimes where uh, I read the scriptures, and I think I know a story until I study it to preach it. 
And I wanted to say that this was the, one of the most fun sermons I've been preparing for. Hopefully that translates well, but if not, I really enjoyed my sermon prep time this week because the scriptures just came alive in such an incredible way that I, there's so much happening in the text that I didn't even realize was fully happening until I really dug in and studied it. And um, I'm just excited to share this with you. And so kind of my, my sermon thoughts today is uh, revival, spiritual warfare, and, and riot. And I'm not going to read the entire rest of the chapter. I'm going to read the first part, and then I'll read a couple verses later. But if you want to read the full account of the riot, you can do that on your own time. <laughs> um, but it's a fascinating passage. And to kind of set it up, I was talking through these ideas with Pastor Ben. He's like, it kind of reminds me of Blockbuster and Netflix. Remember Blockbuster? This row, entire row does not. <laughs> and uh, when you would go and you'd pick out a movie, right? And then you'd, you'd have the excitement or the disappointment when you go behind the case and go, oh, there's nothing there. Or, yeah, they still got a copy left, right? You remember that? And then, and then this new company came out and they're like, you can, you can order DVDs in the mail and then you have to send them back. And I was like, that's the dumbest thing ever. And then when they started streaming, I'm like, okay, I'm on board, right? And today, today, when's the last time you've seen Blockbuster? It's gone, right? It's like there was an entire industry, so to speak, just decimated by the arrival of something new. Oh, this is where it gets good, and I'm not talking about Blockbuster or Netflix. Acts 19 describes the power of God absolutely transforming uh, not just a community or even a region, but also it's the beginning of the end for Artemis worship. And you're like, I don't even know who that is. I don't even know it's a big deal. Yeah, because we're not, we're not ancient Greeks or Romans. This is a massive upheaval that begins Last week when we shared about Paul showing up, getting 12 disciples, encouraging them to fully obey, teaching them the, the fullness of things, leading them in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then they begin to preach the word, and all of a sudden, a community, not just a community, but a region, not just a region, but a whole worldview that filled the entire Mediterranean world begins to be upended. Uh, the foundation gets cracked, destroyed, and within a few hundred years, it's gone. And you're like, a few hundred years, that's a long time. Not when you're talking about civilization. We, we view everything in such the micro, we're a microwave generation. We view everything in short term. But God's not moved or discouraged by these things. He's playing his plan out, and he sees the big picture. And he sends Paul, and uh, this might be Paul's most successful ministry, recorded in Acts. And he sends them there, and within a few generations, this place is not even just in a few generations. There's an immediate impact that's super exciting to talk about. But that impact it starts a tidal wave, a tsunami that changes the world. Okay, I want you to understand, before I read it, you know, and I mentioned this last week, that sometimes when we read scripture, we see town names or city names. We see he traveled here and there, and we're like, oh, yeah, he just went from Mabel to Horicon to Juno and back, right, type of thing. And realizing, like, whoa, whoa, he's crossing big swaths of land. And, and, and Luke is the writer of, of Acts, and when he's writing these town names, these city names down, the people who first read Acts understood its significance, they understood what the local context would have been like. For example, when I mention Las Vegas, what comes to mind? Don't say that out loud. <laughs> but you had all sorts of stuff come to mind, did you not? Yeah. You have events, you've got maybe places, you've got images, so hopefully not memories. <laughs> you know, you've got things that come to mind immediately. You know the culture just by the mention of the name. What about Roswell? Right? You think of it. UFOs, right? Um, maybe, what about Sedona? You know, that's like the new age capital of the country. <laughs> what if I say Utah in general? You know, you think Mormons, right? You just immediately hear a town, a name, or a city, or region name, and you think of something. I need you to understand Ephesus was that in the ancient world. 
Ephesus was a spiritual place dominated by the cult of Artemis. I'll, I'll get there in a moment. And, and pagan spiritual practices, magic, sorcery. It was dominated by that. And it was kind of the epicenter of that in the ancient Greco-Roman world. Not only that, but Ephesus was huge. It's somewhere, it's either the third or the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. This is massive. We're talking in the ancient world, a city of the, the, the estimates, population estimates begin at a quarter of a million people and go all the way up to a third of a million. So sometimes we think ancient world and we just think these tiny little places and, you know, cave dwellers. No, like we're talking advanced civilization, uh, massive amounts of people. And this city was unlike other cities in that it was a truly free Greek city under the jurisdiction of Roman proconsul. So this is like a premier city in the Roman Empire. But it was also, and again, this is what I was saying, when people heard this, they knew all that, but they also knew that it was the principal cult magic center of the ancient world. Listen to this description uh, from, one, from one of the commentaries. Ephesus was also the principal center of magic for the ancient world. Bruce Metzger says, of all the ancient Greco-Roman cities, of all the Roman Empire, Ephesus was by far the most hospitable to magicians, sorcerers, and charlatans of all sorts. That, when I say Las Vegas, you think of something. When I say, you know, uh, Roswell, you think of something. When in the ancient world we say Ephesus, this is what comes to mind. And it's known for this cultic center. It's known for their magic spells and formulas. I mean, there's, there's even in the, ra- in the ancient uh, documents, they have phrases that are associated specifically with them, such as Ephesian writings. Everybody would have known what this was. And this is where people came to Ephesus for these things. These Ephesian writings were, were documents uh, that were placed in small cylinders or, or lockets and worn around the person, but they were magic spells formulas that, that people would write down and wear them. However, as I was getting into this, but best known, Ephesus was best known as being guardians of the temple of Artemis and the cult or the worship, the religion of Artemis. Uh, the temple of Artemis was actually one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. It was four times larger than the, than, than the Parthenon in, in, in Athens. The, 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 it's it's uh, one, of the ancient seven, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. It is larger than a football field. The thing is massive. And during Paul's day, the economy of Ephesus was married to these things. The temple of Artemis and also these Ephesian writings and the magic spells and all that type of stuff. People from all over the Greco-Roman world came to Ephesus to worship there. They came there to get their magic formulas. They came there to get these spells. They came to learn these things and to bring it home with them. And so the economy there in Ephesus, it didn't start that way, but it became just fundamentally married to this cult. But further, Artemis worship had long been the spiritual stronghold over the region, even before the Greeks settled there and settled and developed the city known as Ephesus. But Artemis was actually part of the, the Greek pantheon. She was one of the, like, the 12 main gods at Olympus, and she was believed to be the daughter of Zeus. And the Greek pantheon had been worshipped for nearly 2,000 years prior to this moment, prior to this event in Acts chapter 19. That's kind of when they, they, they say, you know, all the beginnings of Zeus and stuff like that was 2,000 years prior to this. However, by the time we get to Paul's day, it's like 800 years where that religion has, is dominated. It is the worldview of the entire Mediterranean world. It, it, it's everywhere. This is how people believe. This is how they act. This is what they think. This is the, the culture that the gospel is landing in, Right? Further, Artemis was known as Diana to the Romans. Diana is in Latin. And also, maybe this rings a bell, Astarte or Asherah in the ancient Middle East. If you've read your Old Testament, you know that Asherah is something that the Israelites were constantly going up against. This is the spirit that is behind all this. 
She was a fertility goddess associated with the moon and wildlife, but she had long had a stranglehold, stronghold, not just over the region, but, all, but Ephesus and that entire area, long before even the Greeks settled there. I think we would be biblically accurate in setting all this up in saying that Artemis could be understood as the demonic territorial spirit that dominated, controlled, held captive the souls and minds of people for hundreds, if not thousands of years until the gospel showed up in power in Ephesus. Remember in Acts chapter 18 and then the beginning of what we talked about in, in last week, 19, 1 through 10, that Paul showed up briefly. He left Aquila and Priscilla there, he, and he went back to Caesarea, kind of northern Israel, and then he decides to make a long trip back. And so he shows up about two years later-ish, and he, and he makes, and in that meantime, Apollos, another guy shows up. He begins to make a few disciples, and then Paul, right? That's what we talked about last week. And they begin to preach the world word boldly for two years. I want to read just one verse from, from last week. It says, this continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia, I think when we say Asia, we're talking Asia Minor, the, or the Roman province, or kind of the modern-day Turkey. That entire area heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And now Luke is about to unpack what actually fully happened in those two years and how the word of the Lord went forth. And this is where we pick it up. And this is a, I'm going to warn you right now, it's a funny story. And it lands in scripture. Merely a funny story. It's actually a very powerful story. There's more at play than what we just read about surface level. All right, so verse 11, Acts chapter 19, we're going to read through 20. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Isn't that unusual wording? Isn't a miracle already extraordinary? Isn't a miracle by definition already unusual and a breaking of the norm? And Luke is one who he's, write, he's written all about miracles. He says what happens in, in, in Ephesus, this is about the middle of somewhere in like 80, 54, 80, 55, somewhere in that time period, that God began to do unusual miracles. Miracles that they didn't have a category for at that time, right? So that, verse 12, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin, Paul's skin, were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and, don't miss this, evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Stephen were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, whooped them, that's what it says, and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. That's a bad day. How do you live that one down? You don't. <laughs> and we're still talking about it 2,000 years later. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it was written down so that we might believe. It was written down that our faith would be built and encouraged, established. It was written down so that we might come to trust in you and trust in you more. Further, Lord, your word is sharper than any double-edged sword. Lord, you know how to convict, but you also know how to bring life through your word. This is not a dead book. It's not a dry book. It's living and active. And so, Spirit of God, I pray that you would speak to us today. Lord, I pray that you would do something absolutely unusual and incredible in our hearts and lives today. 
pray that this wouldn't just be a cool story that we unpack, but Lord, that it would make an impact in our hearts and lives. Change us today, God, through your word and by your spirit and to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. As we begin to unpack what God is doing in Acts chapter 19, we start with verse 11 and we see this, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. And kind of the, the big idea is, Paul's an ordinary guy. He, he is. He's just like you. He's just like me. But, so ordinary hands, but yet God was doing extraordinary miracles. In this dominated cult region of the world, this place known for their spirituality, their demonic practices and demonic worship, right? Pagan all the way through and through. God decides to send a few people there and he begins to work in their life. Right prior to Paul showing up just a little bit before, there's no one, there's no believers there that, we, that we're aware of. This is the beginning of the church, the gospel coming there. And they start as a small group and that small group don't miss the importance, the significance of them getting right with God fully further than seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God being poured out on them. That's crucial. And then they now have what? They've got anointing and they have boldness as they preach and teach the word. And what does God do in the midst of that? So that's their part. That's what they could do. But then God shows up and shows off. There's no other way to account. This isn't to Paul's credit. This isn't to Apollo's credit. This isn't to the disciples' credit. This is our sovereign Lord and creator decides to step down into the darkest of places and say, enough is enough. Satan, you've held these people for far too long. And today's the day that chains are broken. Today's the day that bondage is broken. Today's the day that the lies, the deception is all wiped away. And the truth and light of God's kingdom, the kingdom of God, shines. And the world is going to change. And so he, he does this through working extraordinary and unusual miracles. The Greeks and the Romans, they had seen prophecy and other things before. Maybe they, through their doctors and through their spells, had even seen someone, you know, if, if the sickness was, not all sickness is what I'm about to say, but some sicknesses in the scripture are, de are demonically induced. Not all, some are, a lot are natural, right? But there are some, there's a category of things that are demonic. And so they could work about spells that appeared to be super, you know, that they're, the spells would work. People aren't dumb, by the way. And ancient people aren't dumb. They didn't worship false gods for nothing. They didn't practice magic spells for nothing. People, you gotta realize that there's a real spiritual world and that spiritual world has power. And so people didn't fear nothing. They didn't make up things and follow them. There was a reason they lived that way and were held under those things because they experienced the power of those things, but they also experienced the fear, the torment and pain of worshiping those things. And so God shows up and says, I'm going to do something that they, it's going to blow their minds. That they won't be able to, to even fathom the greatness of how God is. He's going to show off his authority and his power. And we see this so that, this, it's even, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons, this isn't just casting out a few demons or healing a few sick people, but as the word spreads throughout Ephesus, this massive town, who loves formulas? Who loves magic spells? They hear, oh, this name Jesus can deliver people. This name Jesus can heal people. Well, let's just add it to our magic spells. And so they, they begin to, they hear about this and they, they, they grab the handkerchiefs or anything that Paul touches. And God, God begins to deliver people in such a way that they're like, we don't even have a category for this. Right? And so that people uh, don't just think it's a, it's a formula, the story continues. But I just need you to start off that this becomes known. Ephesus is blowing up with the story, with the account of Jesus' name, people being healed, and demons, evil spirits being cast out. So then we see this. The second big idea is that Jesus' name is praised and honored. I'll unpack the word extolled in a moment. But how does it get to be praised and honored? Well, there's this really funny, weird story that is inserted here about the seven sons of Siva 
who decide to take that. They were, they were itinerant exorcists. That, that was how they made their living. They went around, talk about a dark living. They went around and just cast out demons. And, and you know, the Jews did this and they, they had the power of God until all of a sudden Jesus came and they, and they refused it. You have to be under authority with Jesus to have his power. And so they're trying to continue in the old ways and doing things, and they're probably presumably struggling. And they hear about Jesus' name. And so they go, Jesus. And, and so they begin to invoke the name. They'd heard of Jesus' name and power, and they sought to try out the formula. This is a town full of formulas, spells. And the spiritual forces, dark spiritual, demonic forces and powers, here's the thing. They understand true authority from imposters and posers. And this comes out in the story. You can't just use Jesus' name and not know him. Because unless you know him and walk with him, and serve him, you don't have his authority. You don't have his power. You can't just say it. It's not a weapon you can wield unless you're his. And then it's the most powerful thing ever. But these posers show up, and they begin to invoke the name, and the demon says, the evil spirit says, Jesus I know. Well acquainted with that one. Paul I recognize. He's making a difference over here, and we're annoyed at him, right? But who are you? And he recognizes that they didn't have authority, that their use of Jesus' name, their faith was a joke. A very haunting question is, if that was you and I, what would be the response? Does hell know your name? Or do they have you under their influence? This this story is, and so they they get whooped by this man possessed by a demon. And they leave the house naked and beaten. That's, again, I said, it's a bad day. And it's a funny thing to picture. And here's the thing, that God used this to bring about something incredible. This story became known to all the residents of Ephesus. That's literally what the scripture says. This became known to all the residents of Ephesus. A quarter of a million, third of a million people hear this. And what happens? Great fear fell upon them. Because in their, th- in their, in their world, in their cult system, they're like, Paul because he knows Jesus and has author- he has authority to do these things that even his handkerchiefs and, and work aprons, he's a, you know, he's a tent maker, that even when those dirty things touch the sick or the possessed, they get healed and made whole in the spiritual world that we haven't been able to control for thousands of years. It's fleeing him. It's fleeing his dirty handkerchiefs. For, for thousands of years, we've been held captive and subject to these spiritual forces. We have no, we, can't, we can only appease the gods. We can't make them do anything. We, we worship them to invoke their favor, but they do what they want. And, and they're not benevolent. They're malevolent. They're, they're cruel masters. But Paul shows up and they flee his dirty work aprons. And then when when others try to use the name, the spirits recognize or don't recognize the authority there and says, we don't know you. But the ones who have it, there's something different about that name. This isn't just a formula. This isn't just a magic spell. This isn't just another religion that's being, another God that could be added to our our pantheon here. There's something different showing up. And they fear, that's their initial response, fear the name of Jesus further. And the name of the Lord was extolled. If you're like me, you're like, hey, what's extol mean? (laughs) That sounds like an old English word, church word that we don't use anymore. I'm with you. I had to go look it up. It means to make, make large, to make big, to praise the greatness of, to honor highly. I want you to understand a few months, years ago, brief years, 
The name of Jesus wasn't known. And now it's feared and it's praised and it's highly honored in this deeply pagan cultic community. So one, God begins to do big things. Two, his name begins to, begins to be extolled, honored. And three, and you could, you could say that this is all under the it's spiritual warfare is happening, but, but genuine revival is breaking out. We come to verse 18 and 19. So what's the response of this? Okay, this is right on the, 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 the tail of the story of these seven sons of Sceva being naked, right? Bad day. Also, many of those who are now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. Verse 19, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them inside of all, in this side of all. And they counted the value of them and came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So you've got God doing the, the miraculous. You have this recognition, recognition of spiritual warfare and that Paul and the disciples, the true disciples, have authority and the imposters don't. And they begin to honor God's name. And then it's kind of like uh, a little bit, earlier in the book of Acts where uh, Ananias and Sapphira lie and, and God judges them and the whole community is like, oh crap, right? It's another moment. They're like, oh, oh crud. That very same question of, that I put to you or to me, what would the spirits respond, how they respond to us? I'm sure the, the church was... Uh, those kind of half in, half out as they come are asking the same thing. And what happens is genuine repentance breaks out. And then you see that there's no genuine revival without genuine repentance. There's no genuine revival without genuine repentance. If we stop the story here, people are just amazed and astounded. But the story doesn't stop at amazement and at being astounded at the name of Jesus the community, the, the region begins to be t overturned. Darkness truly begins to flee as the kingdom of God comes. And it's evidenced by people's lives being changed. People confessing and divulging their practices. This is repentance, church, is when they begin to confess their sin. To confess is to admit. To divulge means to verbally do it. They weren't sending Paul a text message being like, hey, I've been doing some bad stuff, pastor, and um, help me fix that. No, they're so moved that they, they are coming out in front of the whole church and being like, hey, church, I'm making sure I get right with God today, and you are all witnesses of this. I have been practicing all that stuff that everybody else does, and here's all my books. I'm done. I, that's who I used to be, and I am no longer, I, that feels like baptism, right? This public confession. But more so. And they begin to burn their books and together in the sight of all. And it's, it's so much that it's valued at 50,000 pieces of silver. You're like, that sounds like a lot? Yeah. Listen to this. This is funny because someone did the, the math on this years ago and the average worker in the U.S. made $10 an hour. <laughs> yeah. You get nearly double that at Subway today. Okay, um, and so, but even knowing that, that $10 an hour average wage, 50,000 pieces of silver, would, in that day, the denarius, the, the common days worker, all that type of stuff, it would bring the modern value 10, 15 years ago to $4 million dollars. Clearly, much higher in today's economy. This is a massive book burning. What are the books? The magic spells, the Ephesian writings, the things that they carried around about them, their, their, their pagan practices, how to do all these occultic things. I mean, each individual piece, there's no way it's that value. So we're talking a massive amount of people. Now, it makes sense when you start thinking there's 250 to 330,000 people in the city. And it's such a large group that the amount of books burned is $4 million worth. This is a, a massive thing. Again, see, if you're just reading and you fly through, you're like, ah, 50,000 pieces. 
hold up. Take notice of what God is doing here. This is not happening in a corner. This is not a small thing. This is massive. And the world takes notice. The world, the city as a whole, whether they believe or agree or not, they feel the fire of this book burning, so to speak. But I want you to also see that these new Christians didn't offset their loss. They didn't go, I got to get rid of this, but that's worth some money. So I'll sell it to the pagan down the street. Or I'll just put it away for now. And if I need it later, I'll just dig it back up. No, they, they didn't sell their books. They burned them and they didn't turn back. A lot of our our idols today are on here. It's real easy to just re-download an app. These guys burned it. They, they, They went to the extent that it couldn't be rebuilt. And their life changes. Revival isn't just the miracles, and the feel-good moments. Revival happens alongside of that, but it's deliverance from sin. It's deliverance from the spiritual forces of evil. It's confession. It's repentance. It's life change. It's going from death to life, from darkness to light. Church, their lives changed. How they spent their time changed. How they spent their money changed. And it wasn't just personal and private. It was public. Right now, there's a lie going forth in our, in our culture and everywhere else that church and faith has to be private. No, no, no. It's supposed to be public. It's supposed to be lived out loud. Your life change should be seen by all. Those who, the people that you work with, the people that, that are your family members, they should see you used to be this way, and now you're this way. And, and, and the power of the Spirit is that we become bold. You're like, oh, man, I could never talk to people about it. That's why you need God's power. But their lives changed. i got to keep rolling. And further, then following that, the word of the Lord continued to increase, prevail. That's the fourth big idea. The prevailing of the word. So God begins to do stuff. This, God takes this crazy circumstance, right? The spiritual forces with the, the, the seven sons of Stephen. God begins to use that to demonstrate his power and authority. But then the church gets right with God. The heathen, you know, the pagans, they get right with God upon seeing all this. And then again, we hear this wording that the word of the Lord began to increase. After the, 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 these guys getting baptized in the Holy Spirit in the end of church, uh, verse 10, the word of the Lord began to go forth, and they heard the word. And elsewhere we see the word of the Lord increased. But here in verse 20, the word of the Lord increased and prevailed. The word of the Lord conquered. The, Lord, the, the word of the Lord went forth and did battle. And it changes lives. God, see, you and I can't change people. You and I can't break powers of darkness and bondage in people's lives. But God's spirit and God's word, on the other hand, can. And so it's not our job to change people. It's our job to live faithfully, to pray, and to share his word. And when we pray and when we share his word, it begins to do Mighty things. Isaiah 55 talks about the word of the Lord goes forth and he prospers it wherever he sends it. He makes it successful. It's also worth noting that the other six churches, Ephesus, by the way, is a, is a church that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Jesus writes a letter to Ephesus because the church there, 40 years later, 50, they get a little off track. And Jesus sends him a letter, right? That's the whole premise of Revelation 2, 3. And it's, he writes it through, through the Apostle John. He sends it out. But there's six other churches. And it's a clockwise rotation from Ephesus. They're the six other churches. They're all in that immediately, uh, that region near Ephesus, kind of western Turkey. That's where all of the seven churches are. Those six other churches get their start right here. 
This is what is most likely happening here is that those other six churches were planted at this time, not by Paul, but by those who were in Ephesus and probably trained and sent out by Paul and the elders in Ephesus. Ephesus is getting so rocked and transformed. The church is on fire. There was nothing two years ago. And now this movement is getting so massive, it's spreading into the entire region. That's why they can say all Asia heard the word of the Lord. Because they probably did. That's what it says. But they either knew somebody or heard directly who became a Christian. The word of God increased as the Holy Spirit through his church did wonders. There was spiritual warfare by preaching the word and praying. There was spiritual warfare happening by casting out demons and taking authority over darkness. There might be someone here or watching online, you're like, I can't believe that people actually believe that people get possessed. Uh, I remember growing up in the church and hearing that and saying like, oh, that's crazy talk. Until I saw it with my own two eyes. Until I saw a spirit leave one person and go to try to oppress the next right down the same hallway. It was wild. Stuff is real. We live in a spiritual world. I don't want to get off track on this, but it's real. And it happens today. Spiritual warfare by casting out demons and taking authority over darkness. Spiritual warfare by delivering people from satanic and occultic practices. It's probably worth just pausing here for a brief moment. Worship team, oh gosh. I need like a few extra minutes today, guys. Uh, Is that um, if you've been dabbling with these things, it's real and it's deadly. And you need to get rid of it. So whether they're talking about tarot cards or horoscopes, Ouija boards, I mean, all the modern stuff, let alone if we're talking about pagan occultic stuff. There is, you know, this resurgence of uh, the pagan gods and uh, witchcraft, all that. Look, there's no, we can't mix with that. And we got to lay it down, repent, and give it to them and experience true freedom in life. Okay, this is, you guys with me still? I'm sorry up there, but I, I need a few more minutes today. Is, and as I've been implying that the, the city is so impacted that the now the church begins to face opposition. We're going to read 23 through 29. I'm going to sum up kind of what happens from there. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way the church For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines, little idols of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. This is a big business. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and you hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul. Oh man, if only this could be said of us, right? This Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. He spoke boldly. And there is danger not only in this, that this trade of ours may come into dis- disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, so that the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, uh, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. Notice just real briefly that no little disturbance arose. Notice also that Paul had turned a great many away from idolatry, including magic, sorcery, and the worship of Artemis. It's also worth noting that at this moment, Luke doesn't tell us that Paul ever went into the temple and cursed it. He stays out of it. He just keeps preaching the gospel, training out leaders and preaching them, and he does battle that way, so to speak. And at this time, they, the church leave it alone. But the response is that so many in Ephesus and the region turned to God and away from the Artemis cult that the cultic economy broke. This is like a revival happening so, so large in our community that bars shut down. 
You know that's happened in history before. That the porn industry goes broke because there's no need for it anymore. That's what's happening here. Darkness was running. The light had come. So the pagans rage and they riot, but they couldn't stem the tide of what was happening, what had begun. The powers that held people in bondage were being overthrown by the kingdom of God through the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through his church. Worship team, come on. We gotta land this plane. The last thing, this is so cool. Is, and we, we know from the book of Acts that the church doesn't get out of all opposition or every story doesn't end the way that we want. Paul eventually is gonna be martyred. Peter is going to be martyred. Most of the apostles are going to be martyred. John, they try to kill by boiling him alive in oil, right? And he still lives. And so they exile him to Patmos. But the world can't stop. The devil can't stop God's kingdom going forward. And so while they rage and they riot, that day they couldn't touch Paul. But the church in Ephesus would continue to fight, would continue to flourish, and the damage to this cult, like this, this, the, the spiritual forces behind all this, they had been done in. One day, this is what's so fascinating, one day tradition tells us that John, who I just mentioned, would come to pastor in Ephesus. Timothy, Paul's protege, would pastor in Ephesus, and then later John would come and pastor there. And while he was in here, listen to this. This is from a scholar at Yale. It says, after the book of Acts closes and history picks up, we come to scene number two of this drama in Ephesus. And some years later, Paul, after Paul had left, the apostle John takes up residence in Ephesus. This is the, now, according to Ramsey McMullen, the Yale historian, John, unlike Paul, eventually did enter directly into the famous temple of Diana, Artemis, to do strategic level spiritual warfare. In the temple, he prayed this prayer. O oh God, at whose name every idol takes flight and every demon and every unclean power, now let the demon that is here, Diana, take flight in thy name. So John shows up, he does this. He essentially curses this, this thing. And what happens? He goes on to say that history again tells us that when John took authority over Diana, her altar immediately split into pieces and half the temple crumbled to the ground. Several generations later, the, the, the Goths would come and they would invade Ephesus and they would finish off the temple and it would never be built again. The, the, the theater that they riot in, you can go look it up. We've excavated it. It's still there today holds thousands of, tens of thousands of people. The temple of Artemis, gone. There's nothing left there. One of the ancient seven wonders of the world, completely gone. Within a few generations, the pantheon, the, the Greek gods nearly ceased to be worshiped. And eventually even a Roman emperor would come to faith in Jesus. Church, how did this start? A small group getting on fire for God. A small group in one of the darkest communities in the Roman world begin to get right with God and get bold under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And the entire Roman world is changed and transformed that the Greek gods lose their power and influence. This is the beginning of the Christianizing of the Roman world. I mean, honestly, yeah, it started with Jesus. Yes, I get that. But through the ministry of the church. How do we respond? We're, we're going we're to close in a, in a prayerful song today. And I invite you to, to worship and to pray. But there's a lot of things that happen in the, in the text. And, and one, I, I need you to understand that we're still living in the age of the Spirit. We're still living in the day, in the time when the Holy Spirit is still being poured out. There's still stories, there's still miracles that happen. God still does unusual miracles. I didn't even have time to share some of the accounts that I read this week of unusual miracles happening all over the world. In places of, of great revival where there's normal miracles happening, and then there's even crazy ones happening. 
So one, believe and pray. Ask God to do impossible things. That's who he is. And a lot of times we have not because we ask not. Let's be a people of prayer. Two, let's be people that flow from our authority in Christ, our relationship with Christ, and let's speak and let's share God's word without holding back. You don't need to mince words. You don't need to lighten, soften the blow. People need to hear the truth. Time is short. Speak boldly. Further, we, we, we need to be people who repent of sin. Man, especially, as I've already mentioned, occultic practices, sexual immoralities, we need to repent from those things and really get right with the Lord. And further, we need to pray for our communities and families to experience the saving grace and freedom and eternal life found in Jesus. Who knows? When we ask the question, what does God want to do in Mayville? What does God want to do in Dodge County? What does God want to do in Wisconsin? I'll tell you what the word says. Wisconsin's mentioned? No. (laughs) But the principles are there. He desires that all men, all women, all children come to know him and are saved. That none, John 12, 46, that none would remain in darkness. Colossians 1, that they would transfer us from the power and kingdom of darkness into the power and kingdom of the, the sun the kingdom of light. He wants to bring us with him. He wants to bring us to him. He wants to change us. He wants to save us. He wants to radically transform our lives and not just your life, but everybody you know. So let's stand and we're gonna close in in prayer in just a few moments where we're gonna sing this song that is really a prayerful song asking God to do great things.
just like it did in Ephesus, God, that it would be here in Mayville, here in Dodge County, God, that revival would break out and that people would flood your churches, Lord, that people would seek something more, a greater power than what they've experienced, God, that there would be a hunger in your people for more, for real, true power, God, that comes from you, Lord, that people would feel convicted of the darkness that they have allowed in their lives, Lord, and that they would take it, they would burn it, they'd leave it at the altar, they'd get rid of it, God, and they would ask that you come and fill their homes, Lord. And so we make this our prayer, God, and we ask that you pour your spirit out in this county, Lord, in this church, in this city, and on your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on, can we give it a hand praise of God? We just thank you, God. We thank you, God, for who you are. Amen. Amen. Well, you guys have an awesome Sunday, and we will see you back here next week.